Vikings return to practice today, which means we're finally going to find out just who the Vikings have picked to play quarterback. Welcome to the Locked On Vikings podcast. You like it on three, one, two, three. You, like it! you are Locked On Vikings, your daily Minnesota Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Locked On Vikings podcast, where we're always trying to learn something new. It's part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I am your host, Luke Braun, and I have completely shredded my brain to bits so you don't have to. That will make more sense in a moment. If you're new here, that's about what we do. (laughs) Thank you so much for tuning in. You can, of course, find this show wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Sirius XM has this show. It also has uh, live broadcasts of all the games. If you want to listen to the Raiders game, you can listen to it live on the Sirius XM app. You can also find the show on YouTube or Amazon Fire and Roku. Just download the Locked On Minnesota Sports app. And for those of you who listen to this show every single day, my hashtag every dayers, I appreciate you so much. And my everydayers will know that today we are actually going to go into Brian Flores' defense a lot. But before I talk to you about uh, three deep, two under coverage and <laughs> blitz looks, looks and hawk rules, uh, I want to quickly update you on where the team is at as they return to practice from the bye week and get, start to get prepared for the Las Vegas Raiders and start to get prepared for for the Las Vegas Raiders. Uh, The vibe as it sounds from everybody who has dared to report speculatively on the Vikings quarterback decision, which is dangerous business for sure, uh, is that the Vikings are going to stick with Joshua Dobbs. Um, Ben Gessling said that that's the feeling he gets. He didn't say like source tells me they're going to, he's not reporting that this is the decision that's made. He's saying that he's talked to some people and that's like kind of the way the wind feels like it's blowing. It's a lot more nebulous and speculative. Uh, and Diana Rossini had a similar one, uh, earlier last week that said, yeah, it kind of feels like they're leaning toward Dobbs right now. As the week of practice rolls on, obviously, you know, they can decide they feel a different way about that. But the system probably isn't going to be that they have like a a, a competition all week in practice, like it's training camp. And then at the end, they decide who plays quarterback. They want to put together a game plan and then practice that game plan. That game plan needs to know what who the quarterback is. You are not going to construct the same game plan for Joshua Dobbs than you are for Nick Mullins than you are for Jaron Hall. The skill sets are different enough where it behooves you to just make a dang decision. (laughs) So whoever practices today, Wednesday, as I am recording this, it is Tuesday night. So I don't know yet. You probably do. So whoever is practicing is going to be the quarterback. If the media even gets to know, they might not allow media to see the practices and we might have to wait all the way until Saturday or Sunday to find out. But Assuming that we do get to see practices and we see who's that first team quarterback, that's probably the guy. Last week, I went into a ton of different angles on this and why I thought that it probably makes sense to move away from Joshua Dobbs, who is no longer the hot hand, as it were. I say we should go toward Jaron Hall, who I think is the one who gives us the best chance to win, not the one we like need to see the ceiling of or whatever, but the one who I think is just going to play the best right now, although I sort of feel like the Vikings disagree with me on that and and that they would pick Mullins over Hall. Uh, But the reporters are saying it's Dobbs anyway, so that's a moot point. If it is Joshua Dobbs, uh, Kevin O'Connell seemed open to the idea of sort of redesigning the offense around him in uh, a sense, you know, not asking Joshua Dobbs to be Kirk Cousins, right? Um the offense very much tailored to Kirk Cousins. What Kirk Cousins is strong at is um, consistent rhythm, right? His footwork is very consistent, both spatially and temporally. It's very good at being exactly the same every time. And that means that you can uh, draw out certain route concepts that break in that rhythm and kind of one, two, three, four. And while I do think that sometimes Cousins was too slow to execute those concepts with the precision that they required, that was 
a much smaller version of that problem than the the one that Joshua Dobbs has, right? Dobbs's timing was catastrophically bad in the Bears game, and it led to turnovers, what should have been turnovers, uh, missed opportunities, and all sorts of offensive futility. So if they go out uh, uh, against the Raiders and deploy the same offense, essentially that would be... Um, I mean, it would be like disagreeing with my diagnosis, right? It, they would they would say, hey, man, that, that probably was just like not uh, that was a one time thing. And his mechanics are actually fine. And we still believe in him. Right. Um, and that's valid. They, they can say we still believe in him and we don't think that that Bears game really encompasses who he is. And we still think he's the best guy. All right. Sure. I will note down that I disagree and we'll move on. Uh, but it seems as though O'Connell it, like we don't have to do that. Right. We can redesign the offense around Dobbs' skill set, around his his legs, his propensity to throw on the run, his propensity for scramble rules, um, which can take timing out of the equation a little bit with things like sprint outs, right? Moving pockets. Um, one of the other major weaknesses that Dobbs has is that his drop back depths are inconsistent. He doesn't drop back to the same depth every time, which means the tackles have different depths to defend every time, Darisaw and O'Neal, and that makes their job a lot harder. Um, with a sprint out, that footwork doesn't need to be as precise. You just need to sprint out. The problem is that sort of cuts the field in half, which makes it a little easier to defend, but that might just have to be the world that we live in if we decide we're going to stick with Dobbs. The other thing is, if, if we are going to move forward with a quarterback who hasn't been there for the first, uh, what, nine weeks of game plans, or I guess eight weeks of game plans, um, might as well completely hit the reset button on the offense because it's not like your quarterback is going to learn those things. He's working on game plans. Now, I'm sure Josh Dobbs spent a lot of time with the playbook over the bye, and I am... I think far enough past the he is new here excuse where I basically expect him to operate in the structure of what he is asked to operate. He's been there for the whole weeks of practice. He's been there for the game plan and the game plans are now theoretically supposed to be designed around him. So if he is a disaster and Kevin O'Connell gets up on the podium and says, yeah, well, you know, he's just still new here. That's not going to go very far with me because you don't have to live like this. But if you're choosing him and you're choosing to live with that problem, but yeah, you got to you got to own it if it does cause you to lose another game, which I do firmly believe that was the main reason for the Vikings losing to the Bears in their last game was that Josh Dobbs wasn't ready for that moment. But on the subject of retailing the offense, uh that could mean QB runs, but it's not limited to QB runs. It's sprint outs like I talked about, but it also means that I think a lot of concepts should have high lows in them. Not because uh, Dobbs is particularly better at high lows than other concepts. I don't know if that's necessarily a, an axis I would even judge someone on. But more so because it clearly defines the scramble rules. So scramble rules, when you look back and you see the quarterback is running for his life, if you are, the, the general rule is... Um, you want to work the direction that the quarterback is scrambling to. If he's scrambling out of the pocket. So if he's scrambling to the left, you go left, etc. And if you're deep, come back to the ball. And if you're shallow, work deep. Um, there is a play from, I want to say, it was, it was the Saints game where Dobbs was scrambling and TJ Hawkinson, who was shallow, did a great job of this. He worked toward the same sideline as Dobbs was working toward, and he peeled off of his defender deep, and Dobbs was able to just kind of like lob it over the top, and you'll see all the time guys uh, catching passes as they work back toward the ball, uh, catching it, and it looks like a comeback or something with a ton of separation because the cornerback that was all over them was guarding like a go route, right? And then you suddenly just stop and turn around, uh, and it's not like a route. Scramble rules are a lot easier to execute when it's very clear there's a deep person, there's a shallow person, and it's very clear I'm on this side, quarterbacks to my side, I got to work to the sideline and back to the ball or whatever. Um, that shouldn't be an issue with a lot of the passing concepts that Kevin O'Connell already has, uh, but it means that things like bootlegs versus sprint outs um, are 
just going to have like a different quality to them. And you're going to have to have different expectations and route concepts attached to those things based on what you want the scramble rules to do, right? Like bootleg with a flood concept doesn't work itself towards scrambling nearly as well as a sprint out with a high low does. And when you call them, it also might make sense to call them to the field side rather than the boundary side, the long side of the field where there's more space to work. Uh, that I think is a small edge that you can gain by saying, hey, we've got a guy that likes to use his legs. Let's give him more space to do that. Um, I, I will get into a lot more of this on Thursday and Friday. We got crossover Thursday coming up tomorrow. But now I want to switch gears and talk about Brian Flores's defense and in particular the way he covers the pass and how he unlocked those all of those blitzes how he uh, enabled himself to blitz over half the time today's episode of locked on vikings is brought to you by skylight frames skylight frames are those electronic photo frames that will rotate between many different digital photos and they make a fantastic holiday gift it's that time of year where you have to figure out what to buy for your grandma or whatever and skylight frames are absolutely the perfect grandparents gifts they are intuitive they're really easy to set up it's effortless to send photos to and from the frame so that you can switch things out and keep those photos current so you don't go over to grandma's house and see a photo from when you were like 12 years old in your blunder years uh, asking for a friend <laughs> as a special limited time offer for our listeners get $15 off of your purchase of a skylight frame when you go to skylightframe.com slash locked on to get $15 off of your purchase of a skylight frame just go to skylightframe.com slash locked on that's that's s-k-y-l-i-g-h-t F-R-A-M-E dot com slash locked on. Thanks so much for making Locked On Vikings your first listen of the day. For your second listen, go on over to the Locked On Sports, the Locked On Minnesota Sports YouTube channel and check out their 24-7 live stream. Uh, I also feel that before I get into this thing about Brian Flores and Pat Narduzzi, that this is uh, some of the bare bones of a wide left article that is coming out probably today uh, <laughs> on, on Wednesday at the wide left Substack about Brian Flores and how his defense came to be. I kind of told that story uh, uh, of him reconnecting with people in his time with the Pittsburgh Steelers and his proximity to Pat Narduzzi as reported by Kevin Seifert and exactly what he took from that and what problems it solved. But that is, is uh, a specific segment that I go into a little more depth to, to. I want to follow up on my show from Monday. So if you did not see the Monday show or listen to the Monday show, um, I do recommend that you do that. This will be an unofficial part two to it where I explained the fronts and personnel packages that the Vikings use on defense and how they use those fronts to confuse quarterbacks. But the broad strokes of that, if you don't have time to go to listen to that one, are that the Vikings really, really want six men on the line of scrimmage, six-man service. Um, with six men on the line of scrimmage, it can break up double teams, right? Because there's just too many people to block, so you can't spend offensive linemen on two uh, two for ones, right? You have to have everybody one-on-one, -on -one and that those are easier matchups to win. And it also makes it a lot easier to blitz. If you have six guys on the line of scrimmage, nobody coming from depth, those blitzes will develop more quickly. Therefore, you compress that offensive timeline. And that's really what they're trying to do is make the offense do whatever it wants to do fast. A lot of off the uh, modern offense's favorite stuff happens very slowly. It's long developing bootlegs and floods and post patterns and, uh, you know, go routes and these scissors concepts and deep overs that take forever. So send everybody, make them compress it, make it get them get to their outlet. What we want by blitzing all the time is to have the other team walk away going, oh my God, why did we target, give Alexander Madison 35 touches that game, right? When in reality, they ran the ball 12 times and it was a whole bunch of checkdowns. Um, that's what we want to turn you into. Gophers fans, we're doing the PJ Fleck thing to you. Make you PJ Fleck. How do you do that without getting your blitzes killed though? And this is one of the sort of philosophical things of football in general. How do you blitz without the quarterback just going 
all right, and throwing over the top of everybody, right? The more players you send, the fewer you have in coverage, the weaker that coverage is, and if the quarterback can identify the holes in that coverage, they're going to slice you up. That's a truism throughout, right? Happened to the Vikings in week three. And it's interesting, after that week three game, they made some tweaks. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll make you go to the wide left article for that. Uh, but for like what those tweaks were. But yeah, after week three in that Chargers game, and then what had happened to them in the Eagles game before that, in the run game, they realized that they still needed some fine tuning for this relatively new system that they are running. I think the best way to understand the system is to look at the Bengal package, though. Um, Bengal... All that means is you have uh, stretched out one more person than the offense has to block on the line of scrimmage. So if the offense has, you know, their five offensive linemen and a tight end, that is a seven man surface because they've got six. We've got seven. If they have a running back in, that could be a part of the protection as well. That becomes an eight man surface. You have seven possible blockers. We have eight. If that tight end and or running back go out for patterns, then somebody will come out of the line of scrimmage and cover them, uh, peel out with them or whatever. Uh, But if they don't, then we add another person to the protection. So whatever you do, we have one more guy than you can block, which forces the quarterback to be hot. And that is the entire goal. If the quarterback is hot and he throws to his hot, we have done what we want to do, which is force the quarterback to abandon whatever cool deep concept shot play they thought they were getting us with into a three-step drop and a check down to the running back that we can then rally and tackle. That is how the Vikings want to compress this. And since week four, they have been a top five defense in many, or at least top 10 in just about every category. Um, It is remarkably successful. So here's how that blitz works. There's a few. So if you see just six men on the line of scrimmage, say it is a 5-0 look, or um, I also have a Patreon piece coming out that is going to go over a lot of this with visuals. And in that Patreon piece, I called it Ragnar. The reason is because at uh, Pitt, Pat Narduzzi, who Flores took a lot of these ideas from, uh, he calls that front the mascot of whatever wherever he's at. So when he was at Michigan State, it was the Spartan front. When he was at Pitt, it's the Panther front. And I guess it would be the Viking front then in Minnesota, but because there are other places that have a Viking front that's named after the double, that's the double A gap Mike Zimmer thing. They just call it Viking because that's kind of where they learned it from was Mike Zimmer with the Vikings. Um, And I didn't want to confuse it with that. So I decided to call it Ragnar. And I think that's kind of cool anyways. So whatever, (laughs) maybe you call it Victor. If you prefer Victor as a mascot, I would, I would not begrudge you that. But the rules are basically, if you're a defensive lineman and the protection slides toward you, you back out and you become part of the coverage. And what you do in coverage is what I'll go over next. If you are tasked with covering a line, uh, a skill player, a, a running back or a tight end, um, if that person blocks, then you pass rush. If that person does not block, then you cover wherever you have to go. You drop into the coverage. And that might not necessarily mean that you are covering that particular person. It just means that you become part of the grander coverage apparatus, uh, which, again, we'll get to how that works. So if the protection slides away from you, you will go. Now, if you remember what I've taught y'all about protections, which if you have not gotten to Go to patreon.com slash NFL. Find the video that is Learn Pass Pro. It's free to watch. Go watch it. But I'll tell you right now, protections will often split in half. Half of the protection will slide and the other half will stay in like man-to-man or whatever. So visualize that, right? Three linemen slide away from the rest of them. It's going to leave a big gap. And this guarantees that whoever is in that gap will be pass rushing. So it kind of makes it so where whatever the center calls whether it's a three-man slide or a four-man slide and you're sliding left or you're sliding right or sliding toward the pressure or away from the pressure, whatever it is, someone is going to go through the biggest gap and the running back will probably be responsible for that person. So you can guarantee that the running back will be responsible for, that could be Ivan Pace, who has dusted running backs a lot this year. could be Josh Metellus, who's done well. could be Anthony Barr, who has made a living dusting running backs through his whole career. Uh, whatever it is, you will guarantee a free rusher. Numbers wise, there will always be a free rusher and you're not compromising the coverage nearly as much to do so because of the guys who are dropping out of the pressure. The only team that has done something against that this these Hawk rules that has really picked it up 
was San Francisco. And what they did is incredibly hard to execute and didn't work all the time because it's slow. It worked a little, uh, which is to have the center slide toward one direction and then go block back the other way. It's insanely hard footwork to execute. You need a really, really deft center to do it. Uh, and it also ha happens slowly enough where that center might not get there anyways. So it's not a perfect solution, but it's the closest thing anyone's come up with. So that means that you're going to have a free rusher all the time. You're going to force a lot of quick throws, but that doesn't mean the end to all of our problems. When we blitz, we still got to figure out how to deal with, uh, what offenses are going to throw at you on the back end. And that's what we're going to go over next. Today's episode of Locked On Vikings is brought to you by Prize Picks. It's daily fantasy made easy. If you are a longtime listener to Locked On Vikings, you'll be very familiar with Prize Picks because we do our Prize Picks prized picks every single Friday. And this Friday will be no exception. Prize Picks is not daily fantasy the way that you're familiar with it, though. You're not putting together a lineup and trying to maximize your score against a pool of 600,000 other people. It's just you versus the house. Prize Picks will set a projection, and you just have to pick more than or less than. Pick two to six of your favorite more thans or less thans. Make sure they aren't the same player, uh, and make sure that they're from at least two teams. And that's all you got to do. And you smash them all together to try to get a bigger payout. So you got to win all of them. There's also flex plays. And that's it. You just have to beat the house of prize picks. And I'm going to be honest, the house misses a lot. The, some of these numbers are way out there. So it's definitely worth taking a look. You can find stuff like that, though, if you go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL. And if you're new, use code locked on NFL for a first deposit match up to $100. That's $100 in free prize picks money if you just use code locked on NFL at the app or at prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL. Prize picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. Today's episode is also brought to you by FanDuel, which is America's number one sports book. That is where you got to go if you want to get a proper gramble in. Right now, new customers get 150 bucks in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. So you can go take whatever the most egregious favorite of the entire week is, probably whoever's playing the Patriots or Giants. Now, Patriots are Thursday night against the Steelers, and they have a backup likely. So whoever's playing the Giants, I don't know, who, who do we want to laugh at? The Panthers? Probably the Panthers. We could say the Bears. I'm always game for that. And I don't care that they just beat the Vikings. <laughs> but whatever money line you feel most confident in, you can get 30 to 1 odds, basically. It's a $5 bet with 150 back in bonus bets if you win. 30 to 1 odds on a heavy favorite. Where else are you going to find that? So go to fanduel.com slash locked on to claim that. You can find all kinds of spreads, player props, parlays, all sorts of sweet, sweet, sweet stuff for all sorts of sports as well. Not just football, but basketball, hockey, current events, all kinds of wacky things. If you really go digging, go to fanduel.com slash locked on and get going during this wonderful late NFL season. That's FanDuel official partner of the NFL. So, okay, let's do a really quick coverage overview. If you want something uh, at a less of a breakneck pace, go to patreon.com slash NFL, but we will uh, do our best here to talk about coverages. So behind the blitzes, like the Vikings don't have like a base coverage. They don't because they don't rush for most teams will rush for as their sort of default state. And then they have their favorite coverage to call behind it, whether they're a cover three team or a quarters team or a man to man team. Um, the Vikings don't have a rush for package that they use a lot. And when they do, they're usually calling fairly vanilla coverages behind it. Uh, and it's usually only in like two minute situations and stuff where the situation warps things a little differently. So having six on the line of scrimmage isn't nearly as advantageous. Um, the way the Vikings prefer to call coverage behind when they blitz is off man coverage. Now they used to press a little bit. They've decided to move away from that, but in off man coverage, the coaching point is two beats with your eyes on the quarterback. So if you're Caleb Evans or Byron Murphy, you align yourself seven to nine yards off directly in front of a whatever wide receiver you're assigned to, but you're not technically covering that wide receiver. You are um, putting your eyes on the quarterback, waiting two beats, and then your eyes snap to your wide receiver and you break on whatever he's running. Now he is running a go route, you only used two beats and you still have all the time in the world to flip your hips around and get running. 
And if it's something short, because you were watching the quarterback, you weren't instinctually backpedaling and giving the other team way more cushion than you ever intended to give, right? So this can work on third and two or third and three. You can still break on things and make a big play. And we've seen lots of big plays on short passes on, you know, second and two or three or whatever that's set up harder third downs. That's the off coverage version of it. And it's not true classic man-to-man coverage it works out that way a lot so people i guess think that it's man coverage a lot there's a funny anecdote in the seaford article that i've been talking about all week about durante jones talking to other teams saying man you play a lot of man coverage and he's like we kind of we don't really (laughs) um but the other thing that the vikings really like to do behind their blitzes is zone coverage but five man versions of it so let's say they are sending six in the blitz um, so they have five players underneath and let's say it's a, it's Bengal rules. So they actually have seven or eight players on the line of scrimmage, but only six of them go two of them back off because of the way that the protection was called and the slide rules and all that. Um, two of those players underneath might be defensive tackles. That might be Harrison Phillips. So you got to figure out a way to cover with five people. And one of them's Harrison Phillips. Uh, so you're not going to go man to man on that. Right. And you can't exactly do the off man coverage trick because he's on the line of scrimmage. So instead they will call three deep or two deep versions of more classic coverage shells. So my favorite personally is their three D or their two deep Tampa two. So that's two half safeties. And that could be a corner that backs off into a half safety. It could be a true safety. They've even done this with someone like Metellus on the line of scrimmage and then backing off into a deeper zone, like way off, like backing, you know, turning your hips and bailing 25 yards, which is crazy athletic feat. And it's actually worked because my goodness, how would you ever see that coming? How are you supposed to read a safety that lined up in the a gap? What? (laughs) It's crazy. Um, but the philosophy is two deep safeties and then a middle runner that turns functionally into a three high system. And then you can have um, two outside players play the flat. That's my favorite. So you've essentially divided the whole field into five really, really, really big zones. Are there going to be holes in that zone? Absolutely. There's only five dudes. There's going to be a ton of green grass, but to find it, you got to have the right route called. It has to be a quick developing route. And to be honest, most hot routes either go directly over the middle of the field where that runner will be able to um, break on it, or they're like to the flats or their slants and those outside players can break on it. And yeah, if you are going to try to do something cheeky up the seam or into the corner, then you got those half safeties to deal with it. So that's my favorite thing that they do behind. They also have um, a three deep two under version where they will play. It's like cover three, right? You've got three uh, deep third defenders and then underneath in normal, normal, you know, country cover three, You'll have four underneath zones, but you only have two players remaining. So you need those guys to essentially split the underneath part of the field in half. And what the uh, Vikings will have them do if you're in those underneath zones is respond to the quarterback's eyes in three deep, two under. They have played a little bit more conservatively than I guess I would like. I brought up that uh, critique before but they played it a little bit more conservative to the eyes than I would like because they don't want to get looked off. Um, And that means that they essentially park themselves kind of just outside the hashes and quick throws outside to the numbers are there. And that's not so great um, because those can turn into, you know, 10, 11 yard gains. And I don't think that that's good enough. And I would love to see them flow with that a little bit more, but it makes you more manipulatable with the eyes. So it's a very subjective thing I have where I, you know, the side of that fence that I like to be on. But if you disagree with me, that's perfectly valid. Um, But it's essentially abridged and simplified versions of the classic coverages that you're familiar with. They also have a quarters iteration of this where they can play four deep on the back end with one guy underneath playing in the middle. And um, the two outside corners will play just pure man to man coverage. They'll just play Uh, It's not even mod, which is man outside and deep. It's Meg. So man everywhere he goes. So you will have man to man on the outside from an off coverage position, but they can walk it up a little bit and play press if they feel confident in doing that. Uh, And from there, you have two inside safeties trying to get things that will break inside to beat those man to man routes. Uh, and somebody over the middle that is going to probably end up covering the check down and end and making the tackle. Um, all of those give you a lot of flexibility against the things that typically a uh, blitz savvy team 
will throw against you. If they want to throw a bubble screen to the outside, all of those defenses have a way for the corner to come up and make that play. Uh, If they want to try to throw a slant, there's somebody lurking in the middle in all of these, right? Uh, Whether it's the middle player who will then become a runner if that slant goes deep in Tampa 2 or uh, somebody, you know, one of the defensive tackles, right? If um, this was Dean Lowry a couple weeks ago, but uh, let's say it's somebody like uh, Sheldon Day. Or let's say it's Anthony Barr, right? If Anthony Barr, because of the blitz rules, is backing off, even though he's no spring chicken anymore, he's following the QB's eyes, and that QB is going to be looking at his hot route if he sees the blitz coming. So you're going to lead those players directly into the throwing windows and hopefully take it away. And even if you don't take it away, you're at least compressing those windows. And there can be some misses with that. Um, I could talk about this for hours and I did on Patreon and on wide left. So please go check those out. I worked very hard on them. The Patreon video will be free. Uh, wide, the wide left thing will be behind a paywall if you're interested in like the history of it. Um, but if you are just looking for like a tutorial, you can go to patreon.com slash NFL. Tomorrow is crossover Thursday. We're going to link up with your boy Q over at locked on Raiders. Truly the best of us at the Locked On Network. Very excited to talk about uh, to talk about the Raiders with him. And um, I'll be at the Raiders game. I'll be at, in, in Vegas. So um, go find the sketchiest alleyway that you can, and you'll probably find me there uh, brokering suspicious deals with people. Go search in dark alleyways for your favorite podcaster in Vegas. That's my advice to you. I'll see you all tomorrow. And as always, Skull.